Part four, breaking down Mike Bickle's personal statement. I am a trauma therapist specializing in narcissistic and spiritual abuse, and we are starting a little over halfway down the page. Mike writes, I ask that my family and friends do not defend me. I have confidence that the Lord will speak concerning what he sees and says about me in his timing. Please do not engage in debates on social media to defend me, and please do not criticize those who are voicing their disdain for me. Please only speak blessing to them and about them. Matthew 5.44 Matthew 5.44 is the verse that says, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So that all sounds pretty honorable and pretty godly, right? Um, and you know, there are going to be some people who undoubtedly believe that it is and that he means that. Um, I am suspicious for several reasons. First of all, this is very similar language to what we saw in the emails, which is like, I will never speak poorly of anyone who speaks out against me. I will always seek to bless you and honor you. However, comma, he also in those emails alluded to a social media storm, essentially scapegoating his wife, Diane, saying that he would share some of those emails from Jane Doe with his wife and that she would naturally be upset and it would just be human nature for her to feel the need to share those emails with some family members of hers who uh, don't like Jane Doe. And so lo and behold, there have been some family members or friends of the family who have leaked some of these emails from Jane Doe, which, you know, if you haven't seen it, you're not missing very much. It was just essentially Jane Doe saying nice things about Mike, like how much of a blessing he had been to their family and how godly he was and all of the other things that you would say to your spiritual leader who you esteemed and respected and viewed as a holy man uh, until the scales fall off your eyes. I mean, you can really hold a person in high regard. And then when you see them for who they are, uh, you change your tune, you change your mind. Several of those emails from Jane Doe to Mike Bickle were released on social media, indicating that Mike, uh, in my opinion, uh, made good on his threats. So first of all, I don't trust it because of that reason and because of how concerned Mike was about this information making its way public in the first place and how uh, frantic he was in his efforts to get Jane Doe and her husband not to go public with all of this. Additionally, I'd like to introduce a term called virtue signaling. You might have seen this floating around in recent weeks as it relates to Mike Bickle and this whole fiasco, but virtue signaling as it relates to narcissistic personalities or those who are very preoccupied with image is essentially when someone is a lot of talk about really moral or ethical or good things. I mean, think someone who is maybe... Uh, portrays themselves to be an activist of sorts. Um, but we also see this a lot of times in context of spiritual communities. Although some people who apply virtue signaling genuinely hold the beliefs that they promote, uh, there is a lot of performative virtue signaling in uh, certain spheres of influence. Basically, they are talking the talk and not walking the walk. The primary intention of virtue signaling is to demonstrate one's moral superiority or their alignment with a particular set of values, especially a set of values that is deemed socially honorable. And there is a personal gain in virtue signaling uh, by means of seeking approval, praise, or acceptance from a particular audience. And you know what? There are probably some people who say that Mike is just as virtuous as he touts himself to be on issues like these, but I am suspicious for multiple reasons, uh, primarily his own words and the way that he has framed things. Um, he's saying again that doublespeak, like, I'm not going to defend myself, God defends me, and yet 
he still feels the need to inform people about how blatantly false or exaggerated or out of context some of these things that have been said about him are. Additionally, he's saying, don't speak up for me, don't defend me. And yet somehow those personal emails have made their way out to a family friend um, and last we heard, uh, that was going to fall on Diane's shoulders. But just based on some of Mike's doublespeak, I can't help but wonder if perhaps he released those emails himself in hopes that they would make it out on the internet. Again, I can't say for sure, but all we have to go on here is speculation and a compilation of patterns. Anyway, once again, I'm not here to definitively say what Mike's intentions are or even to raise more speculation than there already is. I genuinely just want people to be privy to the fact that there are people who exist even in places of ministry and huge platforms who say one thing with their mouths and live completely different lives. Let's keep going. In this way, we can minimize some of the divisiveness that the enemy has planned and we can continue to stay focused on loving Jesus and one another. I am deeply committed to respond to those with complaints against me in the spirit of Psalm 1835, both now and in the years to come. Some who are have spoken against me are friends. I will continue to view them as friends. Okay, pause. Let's look at Psalm 1835. Psalm 1835 says, You have given me the shield of your salvation, and your right hand supported me, and your gentleness has made me great. I'm guessing this means that Mike plans to respond to these complaints against him with gentleness and non-defensiveness, at least not overt or direct defensiveness. I mean, again, I really cannot believe that he is allocating so much focus in this personal statement to talking about how wonderfully he plans to respond to all of these betrayals and allegations and exaggerations and all of these things. I mean, I don't know if this is normal behavior for Mike. Uh, I do know that this is normal behavior for communal narcissists. Now, as with all videos of mine, I need to clarify I am not diagnosing Mike Bickle as a narcissist or a communal narcissist by any means. I can only diagnose clients who are in my office and in my care. Again, I do just want my audience to be aware of the types of narcissists that can thrive and exist in religious or faith-based spaces, as well as the kind of tactics that might be used. It requires a high level of clinical and professional discernment and diagnostics to be able to weed through each individual person's case to determine are we actually dealing with clinical narcissism here? Are we dealing with um, just poor behavior, emotional immaturity? Is this simply the way that a person believes is an effective way to communicate and they are unaware of what appropriate apologies are? So all that being said, there could be many explanations. However, if you are not familiar with the term communal narcissist, I uh, highly recommend looking this up. These are narcissistic individuals who uh, find their way to thrive in life in um, honorable organizations. This can be ministry-based or charity, fundraising, um, activism, different things like that. But essentially, they get to have all of the benefits of respect and admiration of a, a moral life without actually having to live it and walk it out. And you know what? I, again, am not going to say what goes on behind closed doors in Mike Bickle's world. 
Uh, but there are some people who are giving us a little bit of window into that. And uh, according to what is coming out and is being made public slowly and over time, the man who has been leading this movement also demonstrate a remarkable capacity to live in ways that simply do not align with what he preaches. So I won't really get into all of the specifics here, uh, but just to hit a few highlights, a communal narcissist is also known as the altruistic narcissist or a selfless narcissist. They present as very caring, uh, self-sacrificial, uh, truly involved in the welfare of others, um, and they really thrive in a communal-based setting, especially when they uh, are admired or validated, especially through acts of generosity. Some of the key features that distinguish a communal narcissist from other different types of narcissists, um, those would be things like uh, grandiosity and altruism. So like extravagant givers, one of their main ways of getting their own supply needs met or needs for significance met is seeking admiration for selflessness. Appearing selfless on the surface is actually a layer over the top of a deeply strong need for admiration and validation. Another term or tactic I'd like to introduce here is something called manipulative benevolence. Manipulative benevolence is essentially when someone gives something but there are strings attached. Um, they are pushing an agenda. They are gaining control or influence within a group or within a person's life. At the end of the day, communal narcissists are so highly concerned with how they are perceived by others that it is virtually impossible for them to acknowledge personal flaws or imperfections and admitting the negative impact they have had on others' lives as a very real threat to their idealized self-image. And so their whole personality is built and maintained in order to protect that uh, fragile inner child that just wants to be good. That's all for today. I'll be back for part five.